in between Wednesdays. Just trying to get by to the next fix, living between Wednesdays. Prefer the comics over the Netflix, living between. Yeah. <laughs> I take it you guys play a lot of D&D. We love D&D. I love making. We don't play it. We talk about it. Right. Like Tobin <laughs> would DM forever, so he never got to play. And then when he would play, he'd be like, I'm so stressed. What if I picked the wrong thing? Yeah, I can't be a player. Um, a but the last character you were was was a bunny bard, I think. Mm -hmm. Bartholomew something something. Yeah. Long, Bartholomew Bigfoot. Longfoot? Long Longfoot. Or something like that. And I just really like making stupid characters. That are just comic relief. We designed these two gnomes that were going to be Mario and Luigi. <gasps> yeah. And nice. All of the spells were going to be around like the items. So we had yeah. like enlarge. Jumping. And fireball. Shrink. Yeah. Fireball for the fire flower. Different stuff like that. And we never got to play. So <sighs> I think Someday. I have I have like 14 characters and I've never played any. So we just use them in other D&D one shots as NPCs or we put them in comics. So there you go. Yeah. We like D&D. It's fun. It is. It absolutely is. Um, so for for your art style, then um, Alaire, uh, I'll pick your brain. Um, so in in other interviews with uh, True True North Comics podcast, as well as a few places online, um, you cited Final Fantasy and Tomb Raider sort of as big inspirations for your art. Mm -hmm. um, and when I went through it in what was on your website, which again links down below, um, <laughs> you had a, a particular series that I it caught my attention, especially regarding Final Fantasy. Um, so, and I want to say his name right. Um, so the main artist that most people associate with Final Fantasy is um, Yoshitaka Amano. Mm -hmm. um, and he is a very distinct style. Um, yes. Super cool looking. Um, and when I saw your Moon's um, illustrations or drawings, um, I definitely saw a lot of inspiration there. Um, and then even going through Crown and Anchor now, um, it is a, a black and white comic, and I'll have some panels up here. Mm -hmm. um, the way that you've drawn characters, I definitely find the inspiration from manga as well, or manga, mm -hmm. uh, in that you're using sort of unique features and identifiers as opposed to color to make them pop. Mm -hmm. um, what sort of inspires you about Amano's art or other artists who've worked on Final Fantasy as well as sort of gaming and Tomb Raiders? Oh, man. Like, every single one of Amano's, like, titles are just really beautiful. His artwork is also just really delicate. Like if you touched it, like you would break something. Like it's so fine and so pretty. Um, an even bigger influence though was Tetsuya Nomura. He did all the character design from seven, eight, some airships in nine, 10, 13, Dissidia, Kingdom Hearts, all that stuff. I remember specifically looking at my artwork as a kid that was very Digimon Pokemon inspired. And I was looking at his art being like, I need to make a change. And just suddenly being like, all right, I'm gonna try to draw like this guy now because you know, his art is so pretty. Yeah. Um, so that's where a lot of my art, uh, I don't know if you wanna say evolved or devolved from, but that's that was the, uh, the origin story, I guess. Um, and then I really liked King of Bandits, Jing, and Full Metal Alchemist as a kid. Because, uh, like, well, Jing had a lot of very strange stories, but a lot of interesting world building. Uh, I would call it very dreamlike or psychedelic almost. Um, so, yeah. And it's funny because in a lot of manga I read, like, there's a lot of ruins. There's a lot of things that are just crappy and ruined and broken. And I really like drawing those things. So Crown and Anchor is perfect because the world is ruined and broken. Um, and you see all of these things from history just lying around. And there's a story behind all of them. And I feel like Full Metal Alchemist did a little bit of that too. Yeah, because it's um, post-war as well. Yeah, so like, I, I really like both of those manga a lot because, you know, there's, there's an underlying history to those stories that isn't really talked about. Um, yeah, Full Metal is great. It's just, you know, it's one of the best written manga ever. And her characters are wonderful and very well-rounded um, and very emotional too. Mm -hmm. Like, I that's also something I want to bring in. Like, I want to have, you know, a diverse cast where you could look at someone and be like, oh yeah, I go to school with someone who looks like them or something. Like, I want everyone to kind of not like be involved, but be in it 
if that makes sense. Be able to see themselves in it. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I want these characters to be emotional and I want that to be... My, my art style isn't, you know, realistic per se, but like I want my emotions to be realistic, I guess. Um, which is why I have this weird Frankenstein style where <laughs> my characters are stylized, but some of the emotions I try to make more realistic, I guess. Yeah, so instead of oh, okay. Manga's hyper emotion, it's very grounded. Yeah. But then they are kind of bombastic in their... When it comes to like fighting and movement, yeah. like they're definitely uh, exaggerated a bit because I want fight scenes to be very fluid, especially mm. with a couple characters. They are very uh, dexterous mm -hmm. and swift and quick. And so I love it when manga portrays those characters because they do crazy things. You know, if you're, <laughs> if you're fast and tiny, you could do backflips, you could do all these cool things and fights. Like manga fight scenes are probably the most exciting fight scenes ever created like western comics i'm like yeah they're punched yeah, they're yeah. kicked into the sun that's cool but like you know you could read 10 pages of fight scene in a manga and not be bored like it's so yeah. engaging so i always want our fight scenes to be engaging but they're also short <laughs> so i have to do the best i can um i hope that answered your question but yeah it really just all came from like watching cartoons and playing video games. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, I, I think understanding that for me anyway, and, and having heard it, uh, I can definitely see it. Um, like the, the fight scenes in, and I'll put some panels up. I, I don't want to spoil too much of even book one. Um, the fight scenes that you have, the, the motions of the characters are very clear. Like you said, they're a little um, exaggerated. Um, even just the initial fight where, um, mocked and Heb were thrown overboard and attacked by sharks. Mm -hmm. The moves they make to, to sort of defend themselves is very clear because you have those big moves. Um, but as Tobin mentioned, the the way you've illustrated faces is very grounded, and I really enjoyed it. Um, especially even like background characters, just the way that they they're posturing <laughs> as well as the way they look. It's a lot of fun. I love drawing um, background characters. I'm so glad you appreciate them. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So I mean, I. I think background characters can make and, and break worlds. Um, Cause yes, like obviously within the first couple of pages um, when your protagonists are on the page, sure. That's what we're paying attention to. But if they're in like this empty, weird world, it, it's kind of disconnected. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I always love a good background character. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I had a lot of fun background characters that, in that first book though, when the they're market. following Nax. Yeah. yeah. The market specifically, There's I had so much fun Easter in that one. In that yeah. Uh, and for for Tobin, for your writing, um, we sort of mentioned it quite a, a bit here. Um, in Crown and Anchor, and and maybe even in some of your other works, like when I, I read Pilgrim's Dirge, um, you definitely have a, a, a knack for world building and, and getting people in. Um, we've mentioned, you know, obviously you like D&D, you're big on mythology, fantasy, a layer yourself as well, liking mythology. Um, where does that sort of... Or, or rather, how does your, your love of all of those things directly inform how you're writing and, and the choices you're making when you're building your world? That's a great question. So what, what changed my writing and what literally was the fork in the road between like Crown and Anchor and all that stuff and now this new wave is I learned the steps of the hero's journey, like Joseph Campbell's theory of, of the monomyth and stuff. Mm -hmm. It was one of my later courses in university. And I remember sitting in that class going like, this is why I was meant to, to come here is because literally I would write stories and not know what was supposed to happen. Like, you know, I might know what an ending was supposed to be, but I didn't know how they got there or whatever. And so learning that and learning that, you know, they don't necessarily have to be sequential, but in some form, you know, there's a collection of a checklist of some of these things that have to happen. And you read any story and the same thing is, is occurring as well, right? People always talk about how like A New Hope is a very clear um, cycle of the hero's journey with that Luke goes on. We listened to Harry Potter this summer and book one is literally like you can check every single box. <laughs> you know, Harry goes through every single step in, in that. And so finding that structure makes it really simple for me to go, okay, what has to happen 
you know, what is, what is his rock bottom? What is he going to give up to get out of rock bottom or whatever? And so kind of like all, any long form, you want there to be a macro story. So something that happens between every, or like when, when it's all said and done, you can see the full arc, but then you want those kind of mini cycles happening in each one. So sometimes that does happen with Heb. Sometimes it happens with Mac. Sometimes it happens with somebody who's not really even focused on that much. But so figuring out the characters first is really simple because once I can understand the decisions they're going to make, then I go, okay, if that's what they're going to do, where do we place them? Or what is the situation or, you know, what the, what's the theme? What's the commentary that we want to make um, in this book? So we, we had to structure it interestingly because book one, it's very all over the place. They're on land, they're on ship, they're on land, they're on another ship, that kind of thing. Book two, they're basically on an island the whole time. So then book three, we thought, well, okay, they probably should be on, you know, some kind of civilization, but then other stories will essentially just take place out at sea again. So you kind of have this trade off of back and forth. So trying to find that balance where a layer can world build with actual cities <laughs> and civilizations instead of, you know, five issues on a, on a ship. Um, but then when we were designing Crown and Anchor's world specifically, it was kind of a two two cycle process so the first one was we figured out the pantheon mm -hmm. and much like you know greek norse all that stuff it's this is the god of whatever and what was interesting is we did that and it wasn't necessarily just like this is the god of the hunt or this is the god of this we kind of did we pulled some kind of pirate aesthetics into it right so like the god of the wind the god of money very necessary <laughs> the god of money you know very necessary for the pirate kind of stuff and then we have um isn't there like god of volcanoes there's a god of fire and volcanoes yeah so like someone who would create new islands to populate stuff right so that kind of stuff so that was really helpful because then it's like okay if if that kind of um services the world in terms of like perpetuating the lifestyle then what has happened in the past present and future and so one of the dnd campaigns i ran was in Aventus after the stories of crown and anchor Oh, and that was really helpful because it made me understand or I had to think about how is it going to be afterwards? What are the, what are the politics going to be like? What are the um, the that's I can't think of the word like the uh, alliances and stuff between the different islands. What's that going to be like? So doing that was really helpful because it informed what the characters are dealing with or kind of informed the events that have to make that world that way. Mm -hmm. But then it also had to push me further back because uh, Crown and Anchor takes place in the third? Epoch? Yeah, this would be the third epoch. The third epoch. The second epoch is very much like the civil war between elves and humans. And mm -hmm. we find out a lot about that in book two. And then book one, or the, or first, the epoch. first epoch was... Gods and humans, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You, you didn't want to be around during that one. So, <laughs> and a lot of that comes Sounds from, scary. like, I, I feel like I'm very late to coming to this kind of fantasy, the, the stuff that I read as a kid was very uh, insular, right? So I read, I read the Redwall series by Brian Jakes, if you've heard of that, Hell right? Yeah. So yeah. like, there's really deep world building, but it's kind of so ingrained in the character of that world that it didn't really feel like, you know, the typical kind of sword and sorcery, like really big bombastic, you know, changes and stuff. But when it, it was, when I read the Witcher books that I went, oh, you can like be really, really like over the top, I would say with, with that. And it's, it's kind of what Tolkien would do too. If you've ever read Fellowship of the Ring, because that's the only one I've read, um, <laughs> you know, they'll be walking and then he'll just go on for like a three or four page rant about how this spot had all this stuff happen in it, but the Fellowship doesn't even know, or like Gandalf doesn't even know, but we as readers need to know because that's how in depth and developed this world is wow mm -hmm. so seeing that kind of stuff i was like okay you can get away with it a lot more in comics than you you think so we have that moment in the first trade or the first book where you know it's all characters all characters all characters and then you have a narrator and you don't really see that and we we do explain that eventually but it explains like this is the location and this is the origin of that kind of thing and so we don't do that a ton 
because I don't really want to be like, this is a book where you need to really un understand the world. You need to understand it when it's necessary. Yeah. But mm -hmm. beyond that, it's really just characters. And so we do go back and forth with that. And I remember having conversations with Alaire of like, should we even do that? Or should we just, here's the pages, figure out what this is by dialogue cues. Because, you know, consistency and in, in lettering and style and stuff like that is is that but then we break that again in book two so we really kind of are just doing whatever we want now that i really think about it so um <laughs> but yeah necessary like backstory it's not just all the time it's yeah. just like this is what you need to know about this person right now and i believe i really strongly believe that comic readers are really 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 intelligent readers they can pick up on a lot of stuff because you read uh like this is what happened when i read dark knight returns the first time i was like half the story is being told in the background oh. it's not even through captions or dialogue or stuff like you have to look at what the world what the state of the world is in the background and you don't get that in novels because you just have to read word for word right mm -hmm. yeah and insinuate a little bit um and so then the last part of this is by actually finishing from beginning beginning middle and end having it done and then alaire can read it and she goes you know, this part in book five is really great, but we need to hint at it earlier. You know, we yeah. need to start putting those threads up. So there's a lot of stuff that we do. And that's always obviously the hardest part of doing a long form story is mm -hmm. instead of just like, you know, here's here's um, a fully encapsulated story and that's there. Like you have to have those threads go through. So, you know, we might stick the landing. It might make it all the way there. Uh, <laughs> but again, Alaire's a really good editor in terms of that, where um, like she has a really good sense of whether something or not is working beyond dialogue, but also story flow and structure. I know what I want. <laughs> and she knows this world probably better than I do in terms of like, um, you know, I might know the history and, and that kind of stuff. But I know your characters. Yeah. And so if, if the two can merge together well, then people are gonna to wanna to spend more time in the world because they wanna keep following these characters on this adventure. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. It, it, it's fascinating to hear how much you've built out because that is almost Tolkien in scale where you have, like you said, you have these three epochs and technically through your D&D campaign, maybe a fourth. Yeah, it is in the fourth. fourth um, yeah. yeah, and what I, I like about that and, and what I have found is when I'm reading a comic, which is very much so, here is this one and done little story no thought was put into the past or future it was just here's what i wanted you to have this moment mm -hmm. it can always be a good read and there's tons of comics out there like that but it makes it very um poppy um uh, it's it's nice to absorb and like a good tune on the radio you know you read it go oh that was really cool i like that put it down go pick up the next thing yeah. Yeah. with crown and anchor what i have found is because of the different types of well everything the characters frankly the ships um like the opening shot of the 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 main um and i don't know if antagonist is the right word for right because it's kind of he's kind it, of gray yeah kind of it gray. like we we see heaven Ma and they're on this little ship and i'm like that's a cute little pirate ship right <laughs> like i immediately saw it and i was like cool pirate the budget good. ship yeah yeah right. and then this <laughs> giant battle cruiser comes out of like nowhere and it's like okay all right yeah um and what i liked about it is because of the way they're, they're armored the way they dressed um when heaven mocked go and grab their new gear after being over thrown overboard in the <laughs> beginning of the book the choices they make the the little snide comments um about the, the hat with all the feathers in it um it shows how ingrained these characters are and having all of this history to it it's gonna set up for readers and, and for myself because you know, i I've only read the first one now. Um, it sets up like this sense of groundedness. Um, so it's frankly, it's impressive um, just to have that. Golden age to present, digest to oversize. Never miss new comic day. Yeah, no surprise. So where's my no prize? Check the letter columns. Can't find issue two. Yeah. Collector problems, cliffhangers, mysteries. You need answers. When did Batman become Green Lantern? I get it. True believer, not lying. Always up for an awesome summer crossover tie-in. 